Hello, I'm Matthias Martins, and I'm here to continue reading to you from my book, How to Do Things with Stories. We just did chapter one, and now we're on to chapter two. Ambiguity. As we've seen, the writer can't send messages straight to the brainstem, home to the reader's core drives. Instead, as the reader reads, signals travel inward from the language centers of his brain, through many intermediate layers that will change how the message is taken. This is what prevents writing, most of the time, from overpowering the reader with profound emotion. What are we to do, then, if profound emotion is our goal? It is certainly not a matter of choosing profound words. Experiences that stir a person to their innermost core are not so cheap that they can be brought on just by seeing the word love printed on a page. What really brings on such an experience is the constellation of memories, buried thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes that such a word points to. If all these things were brought to mind every time we saw the word love, our lives would be impractical. More than this, sometimes what we want to invoke is not just a profound emotion, but a profound experience. Terror, ecstasy, awe. These all describe mental states that come upon us like whirlwinds and pluck us from the mundane, reshaping us. Profound experiences transform profoundly. They create memories, they create associations, but more than that, they change us in a way that makes it difficult to remember what we were before. If we can't remember what it was like to be the former version of ourselves before the transformation, that also means that we can't remember the transformation itself. We can't retrace our steps through it because it eclipsed us because it overwhelmed even our ability to serve as chroniclers of ourselves. The words for such experiences are only the shadows they leave behind. The basic problem of art, for the intentional artist, is that experiences become harder to describe as they become more profound, that is, more deeply and widely experienced in the inner world. Correspondingly, more profound experiences lead to greater changes in thought and behavior. The capacity of the writer to change others seems limited by the capacity of her words to describe profound experiences. To better understand this problem, we can make a useful connection between writing and another field, hypnosis. Writers and hypnotists are both trying to influence their subject. In doing this work, hypnotists have to deal with a key limitation. This limitation happens to be liberating and something of a relief. It is also something that hypnosis and writing have in common. The limitation is this. For hypnosis to work, the person being hypnotized has to consent. It's not merely a legal issue. If the subject does not suspend judgment and fix their attention on the hypnotist, nothing will happen. By doing those two things, suspending judgment and fixing attention, the subject enters into a partnership with the hypnotist and becomes a co-conspirator in their own transformation. And so it is as well with the written word. The reader who suspends judgment and gives their full attention to what they are reading, will be more deeply affected by the work. The writer can't make him do this, but she can make it easier. When a reader is in this state of consent, the writer's words are not only interpreted, but internalized. The prose flows through the reader's mind almost as if it were his own stream of consciousness. Accordingly, a condition of this state of consent is that he is able to imagine himself thinking the thoughts of the prose. Hence, it is down to two factors. The writer's style, natural, flowing, unaffected, but above all else matching the voice her reader expects, and the reader's power of imagination. Needless to say, she only has control over the one. But writing immersive prose, that is, prose that is easy to internalize, is more than a matter of crafting a style that fits comfortably in the reader's mind. 
if it fits too comfortably, the reader might grow bored and abandon the effort of full immersion. The prose must keep him active, looking for something. It must pose a problem. It must present uncertainty. In a word, it must be ambiguous. An ambiguous statement is one that has more than one meaning. A simple example is this double entendre, common in fairy tales. I'd love to have you for dinner. Some ambiguity is merely confusing to the reader, obscuring what the author intended. At other times, it can be used for humor, like Groucho Marx's famous quip, I once shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas, I'll never know. In this case, the ambiguity comes from the first sentence. Does the clause, in my pajamas, apply to the object, an elephant, or to the subject, I? The second interpretation is much more likely than the first, so the typical receiver of these words simply lets the nonsensical option pass by unnoticed, until it is pulled back into view with the final sentence, which reveals it to have been the correct version of events all along. When ambiguity is confusing, it is because false meanings obstruct the reader's efforts to interpret the text. When it is humorous, it is because an apparently false meaning smuggled in under a blanket of muddled syntax, suddenly leaps out to upstage the mundane one. But ambiguity can have still another effect. It compels the reader to fill in details. The more difficult it is to form an interpretation he is satisfied with, and the more strongly he is compelled by the writing to persevere, the more of his mind will be drawn into the effort and accordingly, the more profoundly the work can affect him. Let's consider an example. Two lines of a song lyric that I have invented for the purpose. I was never just fine, darling, till I met you. Take a moment to form an interpretation. Ask yourself, what are these lines saying? When you're ready, I'll tell you what I had in mind when I wrote it. There are two interpretations. In both of them, we see a love song from one lover to another. In the first, the lyricist used to feel that something was always off in her life. She was ill at ease, never able to feel well and whole. Then she met her lover, the subject of the song, and everything changed. Now, she's just fine. In the second interpretation, the lyricist used to live a tumultuous life that sent her rocketing from the highest peaks to the deepest valleys, sometimes beautiful, sometimes harrowing. At least it was never boring. Then she met her lover, and slowly that changed. The development of compromise and routine sanded the edges off of her life. Now there is no longer any suspense, any excitement just the humdrum of a sheltered life. She's just fine. Depending on the context around the lyrics, or even the tone of the accompanying melody, a skilled composer could bring out either one of these meanings, or even a shade of both. In any case, I'd be willing to bet that your gloss of that couplet brought out something about your current attitude towards romantic bonds. In this case, the ambiguity we're focusing on comes from two slightly different meanings of the phrase just fine. It can mean untroubled, comfortable, or it can mean tediously ordinary. Likewise, the use of darling can be sincere, ironic, or sarcastic. It is similar to the kind of ambiguity expressed in the sentence, I once shot an elephant in my pajamas, except that it relies on different meanings of idioms rather than different ways of parsing the syntax. Both of these may be called ambiguity of interpretation. There are other types of ambiguity. In order to discuss them, we must narrow our scope from language in general to focus on the act of storytelling. In real life, when a stranger says something to me out of the blue, my first instinct is to guess that they are trying to give me information about the real world. This guess is often right, 
it serves as a guardrail for the process of interpretation. If I don't know why this stranger is speaking to me, I can start with the guess that there is something they think I should know. When the reader opens a book of fiction, he knowingly takes on the blessing and the curse of being deprived of this guardrail. The writer is not there to give him information about the real world, but to guide him through the events of a fictional world. By definition, he does not need to know about these events. Their repercussions cannot affect him, for the events are fictional and he is real. The reader might nonetheless enjoy learning of these events, but still he can always ask, why is this writer speaking to me? He might not find an obvious answer. Yet somewhere in the sequence of unreal events, the real reader must be changed. How else could he find value in it? The events influence the reader by calling up memories. Memories of real people, places, and things, some of them having deep emotional significance. The action of the story, the unfurling web of discoveries, connections, and conflicts, will thereby reach into the reader's gut, stirring it around according to the significance to him of the things that were called to mind. Put another way, the reader plays out the story within a boundary, a circle of make-believe we call the magic circle of fiction. Yet as the reader becomes engaged, he naturally connects parts of his own mind to the elements within that circle. This leads us directly to another phenomenon, ambiguity of symbolism. Unlike ambiguity of interpretation, which comes from word choice and grammar, this type of ambiguity begins in the relationship between text and reader. It might ask something like, is this hectoring mentor character more like my English teacher, who seemed like an abusive taskmaster at first, but ultimately helped me grow? Or is he more like another figure in my life, a bully, who belittled me as a way of coping with his own self-doubt? As the reader goes on, the two interpretations struggle with one another. Through that struggle, the memories themselves, the reader's understanding of his own relationships, may also change. Naturally, the writer has no control over this kind of change, because she has no control over how the reader will symbolically identify the people and events of the story with elements of his own inner life. Still she can make educated guesses. The writer brings to mind the picture of her ideal reader. She imagines the elements of his inner life and how they map onto the evolving system of the story. She uses bits and pieces that her larger audience is likely to be familiar with, nagging mothers, perhaps, or comforting ones, cocky classroom rivals, or micromanaging bosses. Perhaps she casts her net a little wider and brings in archetypes from literary theory, the mentor, the trickster, etc., taking and clothing them with details natural to the world of the story. Finally, when unsure, she tests her creations against herself, asking, who does this character remind me of? And who do I want them to remind me of? Testing her own reaction is a convenient guide to guessing the reaction of someone else. In real life, we often find that the most interesting people are the ones with contradicting characteristics, because these contradictions point to a deeper complexity. The same is true for fictional characters. The more striking the contrasts between the superficial elements of a character's personality, the more that character will tend to draw the eye of the reader compelling him to solve the mystery. In the process, the reader delves deeper into the world of the story, a world that he, on foundations laid by the writer, will help to build. I've been Matthias Martins, and this has been Chapter 2 of How to Do Things with Stories. Stay tuned for Chapter 3, Tension.